Hi, you guys. It's Mrs. Leus. I am starting off your novel. So we will be doing novels all year. Um, here's the deal. So we have certain novels that we'll be reading this year. I will let you know what they are so that way you don't read it on your own. Let's say you've read it before in the past. That's okay. We're going to be doing it again. These are our novel studies that we have planned for the school year. Old Yeller is going to be our first novel. If, in case you want to know what other novels we'll be doing, it might be Tuck Everlasting, Esperanza Rising, and The Hatchet. So keep that in mind so that you don't read those books on your own. If you do, that's fine, but you're still going to do the novel study with us in class. Okay, so it is your first assignment for our novel of the year, which is Old Yeller. You guys had a packet. This goes in your binder in the language arts section. And now we have our book as well. Please don't lose this book. You'll be only using it at home. If you bring it to school, we're not going to use it in school. But if you'd rather keep it in your backpack, that's fine too. But we're not going to read it in class. Uh, for now, novels will be our at-home activities during the week. So um, every Monday, starting next week, I will record my reading of a chapter depending what chapter we're on and rec and go over answers from the packet but during the week you will just be reading independently but because it's our first chapter i wanted to read it out loud and go over how we do this okay so i'm gonna go ahead and read chapter one so you guys can follow along we called him old yeller the name had a sort of double meaning one part meant that his short hair was a dingy yellow a color that we called yeller in those days. The other meant that when he opened his head, the sound he let out came closer to being a yell than a bark. I remember like yesterday how he strayed in out of nowhere to our log cabin on Birdsong Creek. He made me so mad at first that I wanted to kill him. Then later, when I had to kill him, it was like having to shoot some of my own folks. That's how much I'd come to think of the big yellow dog. He came in the late 1860s, the best I remember. Anyhow, it was the year that Papa and a bunch of old Salt Lake settlers formed a pool herd of their little separate bunches of steers and trailed them to the new cattle market at Abilene, Kansas. This was to get cash money, a thing that all Texans were short, were short of in those years, right after the Civil War. We lived then in a new country and a good one. So I wanna pause right there. I want you guys to keep in mind that this book was written a long time ago and the setting is in the 1860s. So you will be listening to words and phrases that are old school, okay? So that's okay, it's not these times. So keep in mind. As Papa pointed out the day the men talked over making the drive, we had plenty of grass, wood, and water. We had wild game for the killing, fertile ground for growing bread, on, bread corn, and the Indians had been put onto reservations with the return of U.S. soldiers to the Texas forts. In fact, Papa would go up, what Papa wound up, all we lack having a tight tail hold on the world is a little cash money, and we can get that at Abilene. Well, the idea sounded good, but some of the men still hesitated. Abilene was better than 600 miles north of the Texas Hill Country we lived in. It would take months for the men to make the drive and ride back home. And all that time, the women folks and children of Salt Licks would be left in a wild frontier settlement to make out the best they could. Still, they needed money, money, and they realized that whatever a man does, he's bound to take some risks. So they talked it over with each other and with their women and decided it was the thing to do. They told their folks what to do in case the Indians came off the reservation or the coons got to eating the corn or the bears got to killing too many hogs. Then they gathered their cattle, burned a trail brand on their hips, and pulled out on the long trail to Kansas. I remember how it was the day Papa left. I remember his standing in front of the cabin with his horse saddled, his gun in his scabbard, and his bedroll tied on the back of the cantle. I remember how tall and straight and handsome he looked, with his high-crowned hat and his black mustaches drooping in corn horn rows past the corns, uh, corners of his mouth. And I remember how Mama was trying to keep from crying because he was leaving, and how little Arliss, who was only five and didn't know much, wasn't trying to keep from crying at all. In fact, he was howling his head off, not because Papa was leaving, but because he couldn't go too. 
I wasn't about to cry. I was 14 years old, pretty near a grown man. I stood back and didn't let on for a minute that I wanted to cry. Papa got through loving up Mama and little Arliss and mounted his horse. I looked up at him. He motioned for me to come along. So I walked beside his horse down the trail and led under the big live oaks and past the spring. When he had gotten out of hearing of the house, Papa reached down and put a hand on my shoulder. Now, Travis, he said, you're getting to be a big boy. And while I'm gone, you'll be the man of the family. I want you to act like one. You take care of Mama and little Arliss. You look after the work and don't wait around for your mama to point out what needs to be done. Think you can do that? Yes, sir, I said. Now, there's the cows to milk and wood to cut and young pigs to mark and fresh meat to shoot. But mainly, there's the corn patch. If you don't work it right, or if you let the varmints eat up the roasting ears, we'll be without bread corn for the winter. Yes, sir, I said. All right, boy, I'll be seeing you this fall. I stood there and let him ride on. There wasn't any more to say. Suddenly, I remembered and went running down the trail after him, calling him to wait. He pulled up his horse and twisted around in the saddle. Yeah, boy, he said, what is it? That horse, I said. What horse, he said, like he'd never heard me mention it before. You mean you're wanting a horse? Now, Papa, I complained. You know I've been aching all over for a horse to ride. I've told you time and again. I looked up to catch him grinning at me and felt foolish that I hadn't realized he was teasing. What you're needing worse than a horse is a good dog. Yes, sir, I said, but a horse is what I'm wanting the worst. All right, he said, you act a man's part while I'm gone, and I'll see that you get a man's horse to ride when I sell the cattle. I think we can shake on that deal. He reached out his hand, and we shook. It was the first time I'd ever shaken hands like a man. It made me feel big and solemn and important in a way I'd never felt before. I knew then that I could handle whatever needed to be done while Papa was gone. I turned and started back up the trail toward the cabin. I guess maybe Papa was right. I guessed I could use a dog. All the other settlers had dogs. They were big, fierce cur dogs that the settlers used for catching hogs and driving cattle and fighting coons out of the cornfields. They kept them as watchdogs against the depredations of loafer wolves, bears, panthers, and raiding Indians. There was no question about it for the sort of country we lived in. A good dog around the place was sometimes worth more than two or three men. I knew this as well as anybody, because the summer before, I'd had a good dog. His name was Bell. He was nearly as old as I was. We'd had him ever since I could remember. He'd protected me from rattlesnakes and bad hogs while I was little. He'd hunted with me when I was bigger. Once he'd dragged me out of the Birdsong Creek when I was about to drown. And another time, he'd given warning and time to keep some raiding Comanches from stealing and leading our mule, Jumper. Then he'd had to go act a fool and get himself killed. It was while Papa and I were cutting wild hay in a little patch of prairie back of the house. A big diamondback rattler struck at Papa, and Papa chopped his head off with one quick lick of his surf. The head dropped to the ground three or four feet away from the writhing body. It lay there with the ugly mouth opening and shutting, still trying to bite something. As smart as Belle was, you'd have thought he'd better sense than to go up and nuzzle that rattler's head, but he didn't. And a second later, he was falling back, howling and slinging his own head till his ears popped. But it was too late then. That snake mouth had snapped shut on his nose, driving the fangs in so deep that it was full minute before he could sling the bloody head loose. He died that night, and I cried for a week. Papa tried to make me feel better by promising to get me another dog right away. But I wouldn't have it. It made me mad just to think about some other dogs trying to take Belle's place. And I still felt the same about it. All I wanted now was a horse. The trail I followed led along the bank of Birdsong Creek through some beer myrtle bushes. The bushes were blooming white and smelled sweet. And the top of one, a mockingbird was singing. That made me re recollect how Birdsong Creek had got its name. Mama had named it when she and Papa came to settle. Mama had told me about it. She said she named it the first day she and Papa got there, with Mama driving the ox cart loaded with our house plunder and with Papa driving the cows and horses. They'd meant to build closer to the other settlers over on Salt Branch, but they'd camped there at the spring and the bee myrtle 
had been blooming white that day, and it seemed like in every bush there was a mockingbird singing his full head off. It was all so pretty and smelled so good, and the singing birds made such fun music that Mama wouldn't go on. We'll build right here, she told Papa. And that's what they'd done, built themselves a home right here on Birdsong Creek and fought off the Indians and cleared a corn patch and raised me and little Arliss and lost a little sister who did die of a fever. Now it was my home too, and while Papa was gone, it was up to me to look after it. I came to our spring that gushed clear cold water out of a split in rock ledge. The water poured into a pothole about the size of a wagon bed. In the pothole, up to his ears in the water, stood little Arliss. Right in our drinking water! I said, Arliss, you get out of that water! Arliss turned and stuck out his tongue at me. I'll cut me a sprout, I warn. All he did was stick out his tongue at me again and splash water in my direction. I got my knife out and cut a green mesquite sprout. I trimmed all the leaves and thorns off, then headed for him. Arliss saw that I was meant business. He came lunging up out of the pool, knocking water all over his clothes, lying on the bank. He lit out for the house, running naked and screaming bloody murder. To listen to him, you'd have thought that Comanches were lifting his scalp. Mama heard him and came rushing out of the cabin. She saw little Arliss running naked. She saw me following after him and the mesquite sprout in one hand and his clothes in the other. She called out to me, Travis, she said, what on earth have you done to your little brother? I said, nothing yet, but if he doesn't keep out of our drinking water, I'm going to wear him to a frazzle. That's what Papa always told little Arliss when he caught him in the pool. I figured if I had to take Papa's place, I might as well talk like him. Mama stared at me for a minute. I thought she was fixing to argue what I was getting too big for my britches. Lots of times she'd tell me that. But this time, she didn't. She just smiled suddenly, grabbed little Arliss by one ear, and held on. He went to hollering and jumping up and down and trying to pull away, but she held on till I got there with his clothes. She put them on him and told him, Look here, young squirrel. You better listen to your big brother Travis if you want to keep out of trouble. Then she made him go sit still a while in the dog run. The dog run was an open roofed over space between the two rooms of our log cabin. It was a good place to eat watermelons in the hot summer or to sleep when the night breezes weren't strong enough to push through the cracks between the cabin logs. Sometimes we hung up fresh killed meat there to cool out. Little Arla sat in the dog run and sulked while I packed water from the spring. I packed the water in a bucket that Papa had made out of the hide of a cow's leg. I poured the water into the ash hopper that stood beside the cabin. That was so the water could trickle down through the wood ashes and become lye water. Later, Mama would mix this lye water with hog fat and boil it in an iron pot when she wanted to make soup. When I went to cut wood for Mama, though little Arliss left the dog run to come watch me work, like always, he stood in exactly the right place for the chips for my axe to fly up and maybe knock his eyeballs out. I said, you better skin out for that house, you little scamp. He skinned out too, just like I told him, without even sticking out his tongue at me this time, and he sat right there till Mama called us to dinner. After dinner, I didn't wait for Mama to tell me that I needed to finish running out the corn middles. I got right up from the table and went out and looked jumper to the double shovel. I started in plowing where Papa had left off the day before. I figured that if I got an early start, I could finish the corn patch by sundown. Jumper was a dun mule with a narrow black stripe running along his backbone between his mane and tail. Papa had named him Jumper because nobody yet had ever built a fence he couldn't jump over. Papa claimed Jumper could clear the moon if he took a notion to see the other side of it. Jumper was a pretty good mule, though. He was a gentle to ride. You could pack in fresh meat on him, and he was willing about pulling a plow. Only sometimes when I plowed him and he decided quitting time had come, he'd stop work right then. Maybe we'd be down in the middle of the field when Jumper got the notion that it was time to quit for dinner. Right then, he'd swing around and head for the cabin, dragging down corn with his plow and paying no mind whatsoever to my hauling back on the reins and hollering, Whoa! Late that evening, Jumper tried to pull that stunt on me again, but I was laying for him. With Papa gone, I knew I had to teach Jumper a good lesson. I'd been plowing all afternoon, holding a green cedar club between the plow handles. I still lacked three or four corn rows being finished when sundown came, and Jumper decided it was quitting time. He let out a long bray and started wringing his tail. He left the middle he was traveling in. He stuck out through the young corn, headed for the cabin. I didn't even holler war at him. I just threw the looped reins off my shoulder, ran up beside him. I drew back my green cedar club and whacked him so hard across the jawbone I, I barely dropped him in his tracks. 
You never saw a worse surprise mule. He snorted, started around, then just stood there and stared at me. Like maybe he couldn't believe that I was man enough to club him that hard. I drew back my club again. Jumper, I said, if you don't get back there and finish this plowing job, you're going to get more of the same, you understand? I guess he understood all right. Anyhow, from then on till we were through, he stayed right on the job. The only thing he did different from what he'd been done with Papa was to travel with his head to sideways, watching me every step of the way. When finally I got to the house, I found that Mama had done the milking and she and little Arliss were waiting supper on me, just like we were generally waiting for Papa when he'd come in late. I crawled into bed with little Arliss that night, feeling pretty satisfied with myself. Our bed was a corn shuck mattress laid over a couple of squared up cowhides that had been laced together. The cowhide stood about two feet off the dirt floor, stretched tight inside a pole frame Papa had built in one corner of the room. I lay there and listened to the corn shuck squeak when I breathed and to the owls hooting in the timber along Birdside Creek. I guess I'd made a good start. I'd done my work without having to be told. I'd taught little Arliss and Jumper that I wasn't to be trifled with, and Mama could already see that I was man enough to wait supper on. I guess that I could handle things while Papa was gone, just about as good as he could. All right, you guys, I know that was a long chapter, and that was all of chapter one. Okay, so if you go to your assignment today, it says do chapter one, and then you're going to do the pages for chapter one. So you have the vocabulary page, and then you have the questions page. And I want you to do both of them that are due today. Don't move on to chapter two until it's time, okay? It's very important that you don't work ahead. If you work ahead, it's going to be difficult for you, and I won't have any other things to assign to you. So you please need to stay with me. We're only doing chapter one today. Okay, so it says fill in the blank with the correct word from the word box. So um, these words were used in chapter one. So you're going to use the same words in the following sentences. Notice there are six words in six sentences. So each word is only used once. All right. In the evening, the cowboy rolled out his blank next to the campfire to go to sleep. Which of these things was what they talked about in chapter one for sleeping on? It was the bedroll. So I'm going to write bedroll right here. I'll do number two, and then you guys are going to do three through six by yourself. Before she boiled the corn on the cob, Mama had to remove the... So what gets removed from the corn on the cob? It's the corn shuck. And I want you guys to do three through six. Okay, let's go to the next page. You have questions. You're going to answer each box. I will do a couple for you, and then you'll do the rest on your own. The name Old Yeller has a double meaning. What are the two meanings of the name? If you can't remember, remember what fifth graders do. We go back and we find the answer in the story. So where did they talk about the double meaning Old Yeller? I believe that it was on the very first page. The name had a double meaning. One part that his short hair was dingy yellow. The other one is that he howled. So we're going to write in complete sentences. Yeller means his fur is stingy yellow and then old means Or not means, sorry. Yeller also means he would yell. So yeller had the double meaning. He had a stingy yellow fur, and when he would bark, it sounded more like a yell. Okay? All right, um, let's go ahead and do the other one. Where was Papa going and why? So go back to the text and find out where was he going and why. So he was going to Arkansas, right, to make some money. Okay, so I want you guys to do the other questions, okay? Um, down here where it says the author writes, I remember his standing in front of the cabin with this horse saddled. 
his gun in his scabbard and his bedroll tied on the back of the cantle. So we're going to figure out what those word means, and you're going to rewrite the sentence replacing these two words. I'll go ahead and do this for you, but I do want you to do one, two, and three, these other questions by yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this one together since it's the first one. I want to make sure you understand it. So I'm going to rewrite the sentence. I remember is standing in front of the cabin with his horse saddled, his gun in his... Okay, now what if we don't know what scabbard means? So I'm going to Put that there for now, and I'm going to go find a synonym in a second. Remember, synonyms are words that mean the same. And his bedroll tied on back of the cantle. We're going to look that up, too. Okay, so you guys can go ahead and look these up on dictionary.com, or you can look up synonyms for the following words. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. So scabbard, scabbard, another word for scabbard is, is a wrapping or a covering. So I'm going to write covering. And his bed will tie on the back of the cantle. So I'm going to look up cantle. And a cantle is like an antler. So I'm going to write answer. Okay. So you guys can look those up online, look up a synonym and replace it. And then I want you guys to answer these ones on your own. And then you guys will continue reading this novel at home. Please follow the schedule when you're supposed to read a certain chapter. Do not go ahead and move on unless it's time. Okay. All right, you guys, let me know if you have any questions and have fun reading your old yellow book.